Cryptocurrencies, Hack Your Way to a Better Life by Uri Bednar. The following is an audiobook excerpt from Uri Bednar's above-titled book, recently listed on the Liberty Intertag Publications catalog. The upcoming chapters are titled 1. Parallel Police, Parallel Societies, and the Sovereign Individual, and 2. Lunar Punk, The Future of Cryptocurrencies and Regulatory Hell. Anymore, I wouldn't list a book that recommended individuals invest in altcoins, and Uri doesn't. There's even a chapter with the name, Why I Don't Buy Altcoins. Further, he's not just a critic, investor, or a hobbyist, but an individual truly living a liberated lifestyle. Uri is the co-founder of Parallel Polis, the Institute of Crypto Anarchy in Prague. They have a Bitcoin cafe, workshops, and host a yearly conference, Hackers Congress, which brings together the best and brightest crypto anarchists in the world, including Paul Rosenberg and Smuggler, favorites of the Vanu podcast. And this week, I'll be having him on the Vanu podcast to get the full story of Paralani Polis, his background, and more overall on the crypto anarchist scene uh, across the pond. To order a copy, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash hack your way. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash hack your way. That's H A C K Y O U R W A Y, just like it sounds. Uh, the link to purchase on Amazon is there too, uh, if that's preferred. Thanks so much for your time today. Enjoy these couple selected chapters from your I Bednar's Cryptocurrencies Hack Your Way to a Better Life. Cheers from the Fear Public. Parallel Polis, Parallel Societies, and the Sovereign Individual. I mention parallel societies, parallel economies, and occasionally a space called Parallel Polis, Parallelna Polis in Slovak, Parallelny Polis in Czech, several times in the book. It's time to explain what I mean by that and what it's good for. The socio-political concept of a parallel polis was created by the Czech dissident and political philosopher Václav Benda, in the context of the Charter 77 movement, during the times of totalitarian communist Czechoslovakia. Bender noted the organic emergence of a new social structure, which started appearing in artistic and intellectual circles, as a tool for breaking free from the totalitarian communist regime, especially in response to the rejection of Charter 77 by the state authorities. People who live in a totalitarian society have several options. The first, which most people choose, is to submit and play by the rules, at least to the extent that people are threatened with repression. This is the path that the majority of the population will choose until there is hope for change. Attempting to change the system is another option and can take different forms, either asking the totalitarian rulers for internal reform, Charter 77, or, on the other hand, revolution. We often see that totalitarian societies end in revolution, but this is usually already the last step towards the collapse of the old totalitarian regime. And it was Václav Bender, one of many, who realized that a possible reaction to totalitarianism was to create a free society, quietly, so that totalitarianism would not see it and could not persecute its members. In these parallel societies, people regain pieces of lost freedom. The parallel polis as a concept is related to many other concepts. In the internet space, the parallel polis is crypto-anarchy. Interpersonal relationships hidden behind anonymity, encryption, cryptocurrencies and the like. This is the modern version of parallel polis, made possible by the internet and modern communication and encryption technologies. It is an environment in which people can trade with each other, exchange information freely, create freely, and so on. The question of obeying the law in this environment is meaningless because nobody knows what laws they should obey. In an anonymous chat room, nobody knows whether they are talking to a Chinese, a Turk or a Nigerian. This has led such secret internet societies to different solutions to the problems of fraud, fairness and trust. In an anonymous chat room, you could be talking to an FBI agent, FSB or a common fraudster. And that is why reputation systems, prepayment of fines, escrow services and other ways of operating in anonymous societies started to emerge. While crypto anarchy is an environment that is an implementation of the idea of a parallel polis, it was far from the first. Secret parallel societies existed long before the invention of asymmetric cryptography and long before Vaclav Bender. There are countless examples. The Chinese tongs, for example, are interesting and still exist in some form today. They originated in the first half of the 17th century as parallel secret societies. 
the members gradually abandoned traditional financial structures and began to look after each other's loans, social support and so on. Their aim was to create a parallel social structure, protected from the ruling class. Today's Tongs can be found in every Chinatown. Other ethnic communities, such as the Vietnamese or Arabs, have similar organizations. Within these communities they facilitate internal trade, information exchange, justice and so on. Parallel Polis, in Czech, Parallelny Polis, as an organization was created with my help as a project of the Stohoven Art Collective in Prague. It draws on the ideas of Vaclav Bender, the ideas of crypto-anarchy, and the way of achieving freedom within the borders of a less free organization called the state. Due to the fact that we live in a relatively free society, it is not a secret society, you can find it on Google Maps, and you are free to walk in and visit it whenever it is open. Our goal is to connect people and introduce them to encryption technologies, parallel financial systems, and many other options to increase their personal freedom. Since we don't have to do anything illegal, just promote parallel solutions, we can be relatively open. But, that doesn't mean a parallel polis is an organization for everyone. Only people who share our values, are sympathetic to us, and are an asset to existing community members will get into the internal community. In this way, parallel polis meets the needs of the community, society and mutual support. As individualistic as crypto-libertarians seem, they too need interactions with people who share similar values. Since the opening of the Prague Polis we have gone through many challenges, the milestone for me was the opening of the Parallel Polis in Bratislava, and its later closure in connection with the Covid crisis, and kicking off this idea in other cities, where it is being thought about or already implemented. Polis are springing up and disappearing in various places, Vienna, Cossis, no, Barcelona. A relatively closed community of people who have something in common can greatly increase their freedom, and, if that is an important value to them, they can find fulfillment. Critics of Parallel Polis often say that the fact that we can do Parallel Polis openly in city centers, is because we already live in a free society. This is true, of course, but only up to the point where we realize that parallel societies adapt their form and interactions with the wider society to the actual situation. The first Tongs were very closed groups of people. You don't get into the Chinese or Vietnamese community as an outsider, however much you can share their other values. You couldn't Google crypto anarchist black markets. The level of freedom in the majority society thus determines how open the parallel society is to interaction with the outside. Today's Tongs in the US take the form of a designated building in the heart of Chinatown. They are places where you can get legal advice on immigration, you can get hold of anything you can get hold of in China, you can get in touch with anyone you need to. The parallel polis during the period of Czechoslovak descent under the totalitarian regime, was also not a nice marked building in Prague's hip Hlesovice district. It was underground bands that were performing secretly, flats where in the evenings they discussed how things were in the West, and what was new, uncensored information flow. They were places where some isdat were distributed and the black trade flourished. The parallel polis in whatever form is not defined by its openness, it just adapts to what it can afford. The contemporary Czech and Slovak polis or the parallel polis in the form of tongs in the centers of Chinatowns, are indeed relatively open. But that does not mean that it is a public marketplace where you step in and are automatically part of the community. What does this have to do with cryptocurrencies? Parallel Polis in Prague was the first place in the world where we decided to try to build such an organization purely on Bitcoin. If cryptocurrencies are the future and the basis of a parallel economy, a self-defense against state financial censorship, asset confiscation and arbitrary currency devaluation, can a truly functional society be built on top of it? The whole place was accepting only Bitcoin, we later added Litecoin, and internally operating on cryptocurrencies only. How can an organization of that size do economic calculation in an environment of volatility and uncertainty? In the Bitcoin Strategies chapter, you learned many of the tricks we learned and discovered at Polis. In this case, limiting ourselves by the choice of money that we use and operating exclusively in this parallel economy, expands our possibilities and options. Some problems, such as volatility, simply have to be solved if we don't want to end up in the red. Parallel Polis is a cafe, co-working space, hackerspace and lecture hall. There are people there doing interesting projects. 
you will learn a lot there about using the parallel financial system, parallel education, we will teach you how to use cryptocurrencies. But that's just the space, the building. What's essential is the community that's emerging. These are people who understand you, have often gone through similar problems in their lives, and have some experience in increasing freedom, producing, inventing themselves and improving their lives. Other parallel societies are much more closed. Because of what we're doing with Parallel Polis, we've got a glimpse into some really secret parallel societies. Some of them are opening up a little bit to the world. One organization is made up of shipping containers that house everything you need for life from toilets and accommodation, to a gym, to a co-working space. You won't find this community on Google Maps, even if you want to go to a public lecture, it will take you a while to figure out where it is located and how to get there. If there are any problems with the neighborhood, the owners can just load the shipping containers onto a truck and move the entire community to another location. We have also discovered parallel societies in Panama, Portugal and many other places. These are places where they care about freedom and want to live their lives according to their values. They have no need to convince anyone of their way of life, but they will welcome people who fit into their parallel society under certain circumstances. Parallel societies have been around ever since there was a parallel to draw. The first Christians and other, persecuted by the mainstream, religious groups, supporters of philosophical trends, minorities, ethnic, sexual, hippies, biker gangs or communities of nomads. Not all parallel societies share the values of our parallel polis. But there are a few common themes and principles that these societies indeed share. Why parallel societies work? So what is behind the success of parallel societies? How can there be a society that is freer than its surroundings, which have to obey more regulations and rules, whether legal or otherwise unwritten? As I'm most familiar with the parallel polis in Bratislava and Prague, this view will be through those spaces, but the principles are very much shared with other parallel societies. Entry costs and filters. If you walked into the parallel polis space in Bratislava, when it was still operating in the original building on Komenarska Street, as an outsider, you would feel a bit strange and unsafe. There was weird music playing, because we only played open source music under Creative Commons license, only cryptocurrencies could be used for payment. If you connected to Wi-Fi, you were going online with a Swiss IP address, to circumvent GDPR EU regulations and Slovak state censorship. Around you were strange objects printed on a 3D printer, in the mirror you would see yourself, but also the Bitcoin exchange rate. At the bar you were given drinks that you wouldn't have found anywhere else in Bratislava at the time, coffee with MCT oil to activate fat metabolism, medicinal, mushrooms and so on. There was nothing to eat that contained gluten or excessive amounts of sugar. Simply, you'd feel a little weird, and that was intentional. A lot of our friends have given us recommendations in good faith, start accepting payment cards, sell baguettes, have cheap beer on tap. You'll get a lot more customers. They didn't understand that we went after just any customers. Parallel Polis is first and foremost a community, and one lost person looking for a little more freedom and a little more improvement in the life, is more valuable to us than a group of 20 tourists who have come for a cheap beer, to get hammered as fast and as cheap as possible. Parallel Polis is a not-for-profit organization, and the entry filter is an important thing for us, more important than if we were running a commercial cafe full of people. So the entry filter is mainly about whether one has an open mind, those who don't have an open mind go to the next place for a grilled cheese and a beer. Those who overcome that uncertainty and are willing to invest some time and mental energy into understanding what our Parallel Polis is all about, are the ones we find most interesting. Most parallel societies need some upfront investment, it doesn't have to be monetary, but a parallel society is never open to everyone and free. If it were, there would be no difference between a parallel society and a majority mainstream society. Entry filters can be much more challenging than one might think, and most parallel societies use them to limit the entry of outside intruders. One well-known parallel society is the Mafia, and it requires a proof of committing some fairly serious crime, often even murder, to be able to enter. The reason for this is that no state agent who does not want to become a criminal will pass through such a filter. Of course, this is not the type of filter that we would approve of. Any murder is a terrible crime that must be punished, and, especially if it is in our power, prevented. I only write this so that you understand the range of input filters that exist. 
some relatively closed societies, such as country clubs for high society, simply require payment of a relatively high annual fee. This ensures that neither the pickpocket nor the common crook gets in, but only people who have already made something of themselves. Most parallel societies have a mechanism by which the community recruits people into its midst. For us, it's a member introduction and a vote, with each member having veto power. Elsewhere, it may be an authoritative decision by a mob boss or gang boss. These filters are very effective at ensuring that people within the parallel society only interact with the people they want to interact with. In a parallel society, it must be clear beyond doubt who is in and who is an outsider. The input filter also checks the willingness to play by the local rules. Internal rules. Most parallel companies are governed by some internal rules. Sometimes they are written, sometimes unwritten, sometimes it is a dictatorship of a chief. For us, these rules are mainly based on values and free expression, especially in the form of creativity. In some parallel polis, someone creates these rules, we mainly discover them. We find this a nice contrast with the majority society, which is generated by prohibitions and commands. People don't have money for vacations. We will introduce holiday vouchers. We don't like some of the non-environmentally friendly solutions. We ban them. Do we need a new road? We build it, this in most cases means we contract our friends at a construction company to build it and get a nice kickback, everyone pays for it. Our internal rules are only there to maximize positive creative interactions. We create a free and inspiring environment. This often sounds like an empty phrase, but after working in corporations, most of us need to learn this. Instead of saying no or yes, but, I'm learning to say yes, and, I replace you've come up with a new project, but I don't like how you're presenting it with you've come up with a new project, and I've thought of a better way to present it to the public, come and see. Reducing internal transaction costs. If all goes well, parallel polis are made up of people with shared values, who follow the mutually agreed on rules, and really want to be in that group of people, because they were willing to invest the energy into becoming part of that social unit. If that succeeds, we have an amazing source of human creativity and cooperation. First of all, just being part of a parallel society adds a very good foundation to a person's reputation. This book was created by cooperation of many members of Parallel Polis. I've known for a long time what they can do because I work with them, interact with them and know them well, so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. The business part of the deal in both cases took about half a minute. I don't have to worry about them not doing the job well, they don't have to worry about me not paying them. And we haven't signed any contract, not even everyone in the community knows about our agreement. If I let them do the work and didn't pay them, my reputation in the community would plummet immediately. The advantage of this possibility of reaching quick agreements would be lost. I would be out. Entrepreneurial coach and founder of strategic coach Dan Sullivan, explains that what many people don't see on the outside, are the collaborations between different companies or people. If the collaboration makes sense, you just have to verbally agree how it will work and shake hands. There is no need to set up any joint venture company or sign a 50-page contract. The interaction between two entities either pays off for both parties or needs to be terminated. There is no need to be hampered by complicated coverages for all exceptional situations. If this cooperation fails, another will come along. Besides, if I have to enforce the contract in state court, I've already failed. Sullivan says the most profitable collaborations are negotiated. In the hallway in 10 minutes. Most of the time they turn out well, and when they stop being mutually beneficial, he look for other collaborations. Transaction costs are the costs of discovery, who can I do business with, the costs of negotiation, what are fair terms, what form will payment take and when, and the costs of dispute resolution, what if one party fails to comply with the terms. In sharing economy applications, all of this happens in the background. If I call an Uber, the cost of discovery is launching the Uber app and clicking a button to order a car. Uber finds a driver for me who is nearby and currently willing to take me where I want to go for a pre-agreed price. The cost of discovering and arranging is extremely low, and in most cases we manage to do it while getting dressed, or doing the last bathroom visit before leaving. Uber also reduces the cost of dispute resolution. It prevents.
disputes in the first place because it doesn't allow the driver to give me a ride halfway across town or turn on some crazy fare on the taxi meter. But if there were to be a problem, the reputation system kicks in and Uber's support staff resolves the issues. This system works so well that I've occasionally had Uber tell me that it doesn't think the driver took me the most optimal route and refunded some of my money. Since everyone involved knows that Uber is efficient at this, Uber drivers don't even try to cheat anymore. What does Uber have in common with parallel societies? If you want to be a driver, you have to meet some entry requirements. You can try once, you cannot just come back after being kicked out. Once the driver invests those costs, she or he takes advantage of being in that parallel society to maximize the business interactions the way she or he wants to. No one is forcing the drivers to work or not work, they do it when they want and when the conditions suit them. They do not have to worry about the client not paying them or damaging their car, Uber handles these situations as well. Justice and ostracization if there is a problem, it rarely ends up in state court, usually the reputation system or Uber's support will resolve it. At worst, the person in question will be fired from Uber, and they can no longer work as a driver. And that's a big expense, because the app is so useful to both parties, that few people want to be fired. It is similar with parallel societies. I have invested energy in creating or joining a parallel society. I enjoy being able to discover new people with whom I can do everything from going to the sauna together to setting up a business abroad. I have relative confidence that I won't get scammed because they have invested those costs as well, and it's much better for them to be in a parallel society than out of it, otherwise they don't save the transaction costs, and don't have a sense of positive community interaction. At the same time, these interactions are freer than those in mainstream society. Chinese tongs do not address whether a local restaurant has a stamp of approval from a government organization, or whether a tong member is in the country on a legal visa. Tongs provide members with facilities and a freer environment, even though they themselves also have some rules. Every Chinese knows that it is better to be in than out, and they are willing to undergo some entry costs to be in. If two members of a tong have a dispute, there is no need to wait for the slow and inefficient state court, they will resolve the dispute within the community. No one will go to jail, but at the same time no one can be left with the feeling of injustice that has not been handled and both parties being happy members of the tong. The dispute either has to be solved or someone is kicked out of the community. Like the tong parallel polis is not located between four walls and a roof, it is not made up of a bar and furniture inside and benches on the patio. It's a community of people working together to create and generate a freer society for themselves, where people who care about freedom can be themselves, and let their creativity and productivity float free. The Parallel Polis as a Generator of Freedom How did Vaclav Bender imagine a parallel polis during the period of Czechoslovak descent? He created a concept of a space in which human rights and freedoms were to be respected, even though the state tended to restrict them. They created a second culture in the form of illegal concerts, some misdead tapes, or banned books, theater plays, and so on. Parallel culture outside the state is also important in our contemporary parallel polis, where we are trying to discover artists who operate outside the state system. We believe that only independent culture can be truly free. If the projects that have the possibility to be promoted have the characteristic that their funding is approved by an arts support commission, isn't such a commission a co-author of the work? Or a censor? Isn't there self-censorship going on? Artists making art so that it has a chance to pass the commission's selection. Parallel schooling in Bender's vision ensured the transmission of education beyond what the state provided in official schools residential seminaries and various educational societies and academies, parallel information systems, some visits and unofficial journals, and a parallel economy, i.e. a black market, the unregulated sale of everything people needed. In the current parallel polis, you can buy your first cryptocurrencies upon entering. If you don't know how to do it, someone will help you out, you just need to have an open mind, some cash, the crypto ATM doesn't take cards, and possibly a mobile phone on you. Then you can sit down, if you came alone, to chat with someone in the cafe, have a coffee or buy a hack of drinks or snacks. If you're up for a longer stay or repeated visits, you can join a co-working space where you can work at a computer, record a podcast in the podcasting studio, etc. 
if you've already made some social connections, you can consult with people who might have something interesting to say about things you're dealing with in your life and work. One could even say that the real and most important parallel policies today is not the dissident world, but the world of the mincet and private interests of the whole of society, which, although with one hand it gives the totalitarian power what it unconditionally demands of it, on the other hand at the same time does everything it wants to do, and which has nothing to do with the will of this power. Vaclav Bender Importantly, parallel societies rarely come into direct conflict with state power. The members do whatever the state immediately requires of them under the threat of a significant risk of persecution, on the other hand, they try to organize themselves on the basis of their own rules, to explore new possibilities for organizing society. Thus, in most parallel societies, you won't find a meth lab or stolen cars, but rather people saving in Bitcoin, a private wellness center, or an educational organization that operates outside of the usual mainstream groupings. The parallel polis is a positive expression of the freedom that is based on creativity and production, the positive use of creative freedom to create a better world, here and now. Sovereign individual. We have moved from individual need for freedom to parallel societies that make certain aspects of freedom more widespread. Can we take anything back from these parallel societies to the theme of individual freedom? In the 1997 book The Sovereign Individual, Mastering the Transition to the Information Age by William Rees Mogg and James Dale Davidson, you could read that with the emergence of electronic money, which the authors anticipated, and only came in 2008 to 2009 with the invention of Bitcoin, and the spread of the internet, there would be a rediscovery of a freer society. Why was electronic money, now known as cryptocurrencies, key in this? Because the power to control financial flows is one of the primary ways to enforce laws, even outside the jurisdiction of a given state. People calculate that if they can do things over the internet, they will radically improve their quality of life, after moving to a country with lower taxes, lower cost of living, and switching to hard money. In 1997, the authors of Sovereign Individual calculated that if you stop a random person on the street in New York or Toronto, you can ask them if they would be willing to move to a tropical tax haven, Bermuda, if it would make them $55 million. And that question was rightly asked, because that was the average lifetime savings of any average person living in these cities who would reinvest that money instead of paying taxes. In the meantime, the markets have changed a bit, we have no safe yield, and we are speculating on the future prices of cryptocurrencies, stocks, or other investment assets. But the fact remains that the tax burden is indeed extreme, and many people save a lot of money by moving to a tax haven. However, the conditions are that your income does not fall, i.e. you can work for similar paying customers or employers, as in the original tax hell you are escaping from, and that you can accept money from them. The first condition is met by the internet and most of the work that people do over the internet. Digital nomads who program, do marketing consulting, trade or other activities that can be done over the internet, can sit in Bali and earn German wages. In addition to regular digital nomads who operate in freelancer mode, there is also the possibility of decentralized autonomous organizations that operate in the cloud, outside of standard jurisdictions. The COVID crisis has taught us that there is a lot more that can be done from home more remotely than we thought. Even some medical diagnostics, prescribing medicines or teaching in person, from primary schools to universities. But that doesn't mean just swapping the office chair for a couch and colleagues' bodies for a screen and webcam. Often what we do needs to be reinvented and organized a little differently. The second condition is to be able to receive money regardless of where we receive it from and where we are. This is possible thanks to cryptocurrencies. However, many of you will say that it is not a problem to receive money by international money wire. It really is and the more you do it, the more you understand how cryptocurrencies help. First of all, it's not exactly easy to open bank accounts in foreign countries these days. And explain to your customer that they have to send you money to Panama or the Cayman Islands, their tax auditor or banker won't be very happy. But sending money in Bitcoin is no problem. States have relied on the payment network to enforce tax collection. They can't force all countries to form a tax cartel and raise taxes, and it's not because for the lack of trying. 
for many countries with territorial taxation such as Paraguay, Uruguay, Panama or Dubai, the influx of immigrants fleeing tax hells is a source of revenue immigrants bring capital from another country and spend it in the country where they move to. It has proved easier for states to force financial institutions to monitor financial flows and make it as uncomfortable as possible for such firms and individuals to operate in this way. For example, there are various watchlists where payments to and from certain countries are under special scrutiny. But the old systems of taxation no longer make sense if people from Panama, Singapore and the Czech Republic get together, and during a joint video call, they solve a problem for which they get paid, where was this income created? And if a decentralized autonomous organization, which operates under no formal entity in any country, pays for solving that problem and pays everyone in cryptocurrencies, the tax enforcement apparatus has a problem. In that case, there will be no reporting, no dividend declaration forms, and not even withholding taxes. The decentralized autonomous organization doesn't even need to know what countries people are in. Many DAOs manage funds in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and the board members are people from the internet, with a history of good reputation, hopefully, whom everyone knows only by nicknames, and no one has any idea what their legal names are, let alone where they are physically located. This is not to say that people from the countries in question can legally accept this money and not be taxed, probably not. And again I am not giving tax or accounting advice. I'm just saying that the world has gotten a lot more complicated for tax enforcement with the advent of the internet, bitcoin, and remote work, and it has gotten a lot easier for people. Old rules stop making sense in practice. Thanks to these technologies, anyone can get involved in international cooperation, no matter if they are from Iran, Belarus, Nigeria, Singapore or the USA. Decentralized global teams are now common in traditional companies too, not just with crypto enthusiasts. A Googler from New York can be on the same team as a colleague from Zurich, and everything works. The world has shrunk and globalized for good. The distinctions are blurring, and a smart person from Minsk can make a New York salary just fine, but may still have Belarusian expenses. Sovereign Individual is a book that anticipated all this and maps out these individual possibilities for engaging in the emerging parallel economy. This is not to say that the parallel economy hasn't been here before. By various estimates it accounts for 10 to 50 percent of most countries' GDP. The parallel economy is the plumber who fixes your leaky sink and doesn't declare the income. But the crypto parallel economy is different. It is global and built on quite specific principles and values. The fact that it doesn't generate a receipt or an invoice along the way is the less important aspect. By the way just like a plumber it can declare the income and pay taxes. Doing business using cryptocurrencies is fully legal, relatively clear and simple, and not to be fit. Much more interestingly, if someone accepts Bitcoin, I know that they are involved in this economy, probably some aspects of the freedom and values of hard money have stuck to them. Presumably this person doesn't want their money devalued by a central bank. And this is the key. The parallel crypto economy does create a somewhat looser parallel society, but one that is composed of a multitude of individuals who can interact based on shared values. And they do this without having to be in any particular building, have any common philosophy, or be covered by any organizational structure. Peer-to-peer -peer network of relationships. And here we come to the critique of parallel polis-style societies, which has a point that is, it's worth thinking about. Creating a parallel society is difficult. Most people want to live their lives and don't want to submit to complicated uniform rules to build some kind of shared community. Parallel polis can allow a certain group of people to function in an environment that suits them. But in the wider society, relationships are highly individual. A group of just 10 people may have trouble agreeing on some rules or on a common way of functioning. And even if they do agree on them, they are often a compromise that doesn't actually suit anyone fully. In wider society, contractual relations are a subject of constant negotiation and discovery. That is why I am not a fan of standardized employment relationships, nor, for example, of standardized marital relationships. The framework into which society tries to pigeonhole complex interpersonal relationships may suit the majority, but it suits almost no one completely. Someone is on an intermittent fasting diet and doesn't want to take a lunch break, preferring to take a walk or do something else entirely. Or they might rather go home early. 
someone would prefer not to work on Wednesdays, I recommend replacing Wednesday with a full day date with a partner. Someone would prefer to work in the evening and can't handle getting up at 9, according to the employer's wishes. Someone wants to earn extra money on public holidays, but the state forbids it. Someone wants to be rewarded for performance, by delivering or driving for sharing economy platforms, for example, someone wants 40 days of vacation, someone wants to work only half of a year, and someone wants to pay off a loan quickly, and wants to work 7 days a week. All of these individual preferences are up to individual agreement, and a society even a parallel one can't avoid some pigeonholing. A complex negotiation that maximizes the satisfaction of all parties involved wants a standardized rule to check out. What if I don't want any social insurance or a retirement fund and I want to save for retirement myself? What if I want to buy commercial health insurance from a foreign company? However, if we look at ideas of individualism, sovereignty, and the new ways of working, we have opportunities to explore, and we can individualize all of these relationships to suit all parties. The shorthand of uniform social rules gives us a lot, but it also takes a lot away. It is digital nomads, remote working, cryptocurrencies and new forms of collaboration without national borders, that allow us to discover new ways of functioning and individualize our lives. As a result, we can try what works for us, choose the environments in which we function, and interact professionally with people with whom we complement each other. We benefit from our unique abilities. If we also switch our jobs into peer-to-peer -peer mode, cryptocurrencies literally encourage this, we can work together on larger projects, but without giving up our own individuality, without giving up ourselves. Is it for everyone? The way I operate in life is certainly not for everyone. But that's the benefit of opening up the possibilities. Cryptocurrencies add options to our lives. Moving halfway across the world to another country, using private money, private healthcare, or doing business internationally, is a scary thought for many people. But the added possibilities give us the level of security and familiarity that we want. Understanding that we have new options doesn't necessarily mean quitting our jobs and working for decentralized autonomous organizations right away. Still, it's nice to perceive that employment is not the only option. Knowing about other options even adds an additional safety net. If we know how decentralized autonomous organizations work, we still have a backup plan. We can apply to work for the DAO in case something happens to our current job. For example, if we work for an employer, it may happen that, for example, due to regulations, the whole industry in which our employer does business becomes unprofitable in the country where we live. We will simply never find a job in that industry in that country again. In such a case, it is good to know that we have the possibility of working with a decentralized autonomous organization, without having to physically move. This example happens often specifically with cryptocurrencies. The over-regulated environment drives companies to less regulated countries, but that doesn't mean that a programmer for a foreign company can't work from an over-regulated European Union country. People often tell me that not everyone can work in the mode that suits me. Not everyone can and wants to take advantage of global opportunism. There are some people who want to have a contract job, a 9 to 5 job, and an insurance card, and anything else that does not fit in these boxes, induces long-lasting chronic stress in them. That's true, but on the other hand, my way of life doesn't negate the traditional and conventional. Anyone who wants to can feel free to work as they have been, in a standard job, physically at an office building, 9 to 5. My way and opening up to it only adds possibilities, but it doesn't deprive you of anything. The traditional objection, talk to a worker at a car manufacturing plant to see if his problems are solved by your parallel police runs up against a misunderstanding of parallel societies. Just as each person likes different music, different movies, different money, and enjoys different food, the solution to the problems we solve in society is dependent on individual preferences. In some parallel societies there are people who don't click with each other, so some of them start their own parallel society. So one can choose in which society or societies one participates. People can cherry-pick. Walk on the state-built city sidewalks, use state-built roads and yet use non-state money. Use state social insurance, but generate their own electricity off the grid from renewable sources. So no one philosophy solves all the people's problems. But each person can choose how they solve their problems, and with whom they want to maintain interpersonal and business relationships. And there is another connection with cryptocurrencies. 
these are also just another option. If you're stressed about volatility, you don't trust them, you don't understand how they can work, there's nothing stopping you from using gold or even government fiat money. Cryptocurrencies are just another option. But even if you don't trust them enough to go all in, they can still serve as a convenient backup in case something happens to the traditional financial system. To the extent that overexposure doesn't cause you stress, but at least enough so that in the unlikely but possible event of a traditional financial system meltdown, you'll be able to get back on your feet and keep functioning. Just as I don't think I should convince people to operate in a parallel society, peer-to-peer -peer relationships, or outside of employment, I don't require people to adopt cryptocurrencies en masse. This is where I differ from many Bitcoin maximalists. I think hyperbitcoinization, where Bitcoin becomes the reserve or even the only currency, is highly unlikely. And most importantly it is not a measure of success. In late 2019, just before the pandemic, enthusiasts in suits and ties started running around cryptocurrency conferences again. They built their hodling philosophy on the belief that big institutional investors would come after them, and they would start selling their bitcoins for fiat, at several hundred times returns. Every pension fund should have exposure to cryptocurrencies, officials of various countries should approve ETF funds, so that anyone with an account with a broker will be able to buy Bitcoin in the form of bank coin. And then the big companies will follow suit. Some ETFs have actually appeared on the markets, and some companies have actually bought Bitcoin. But during the pandemic, that narrative has died down. And I'm glad. Because Bitcoin is successful even if institutions don't buy it, if there are no Bitcoin ETFs, and people in suits and ties would rather buy something else than Bitcoin. For me, Bitcoin will be successful when it forms the basis of a peer-to-peer -peer economy. When it enables what the authors of Sovereign Individual described. When it drives not all transactions, but only part of the parallel economy. And when all users will share at least some core values with me. That will be a much nicer Bitcoin than the one that will be held on the balance sheet of the Bangladesh Central Bank, the New York State Teachers Pension Fund, and, in the form of a bank coin ETF, by the members of the golf club in Asuncion. I'd like Bitcoin to remain ever so slightly parallel and ever so slightly punk. Cryptocurrencies. Hack your way to a better life by Uri Bednar. Recently listed on the Liberty Intertag Publications catalog, to order a copy, just visit lipnandertag.com forward slash hack your way. Again, lipnandertag.com forward slash hack your way. Uh, the link to purchase on Amazon is there too, uh, if that's preferred. Cheers from the Fear Republic. <laughs>